Hey everybody, it's Ben here, and today I want to ask you, what do laser cutting and 3D printing have in common with a 1950s tractor? Well, we're going to find out today when we muse about electric tractor design. If you've watched this channel, you probably know that a while back I started an electric tractor conversion project taking a 1950s tractor, uh, updating it to a modern electric kind of a resto mod kind of a project. Uh, of course, it's been kind of slow. Um, COVID, deaths in the family, health issues, those sorts of things. But today, uh, I want to talk about the general thoughts of the project right now uh, and where we're going with it. And actually, just starting with a couple of main thoughts. At this point right now, I'm thinking the project should use a 72-volt system and be using a brushless DC motor and a particular motor controller. Uh, the great thing with the brushless DC motors, uh, they provide for uh, regenerative braking. They have uh, very good motor speed control. So that's, uh, again, really good for a tractor in terms of, you know, maybe the original didn't necessarily have great brakes. Or if you take out the engine, you can't use engine braking anymore. So being able to have regenerative braking in there uh, can potentially really help with things. Uh, the other thing is believe it or not, Mott Energy is actually a local company to me. Uh, they make some great motor designs. Uh, this is the same guy going way back to the uh, the Briggs & Stratton E-Tech electric motor. And if we take a quick look here, uh, Mott Energy uh, has some uh, very nice brush uh, brushless DC designs. Let's take a look here at this ME117. Pretty compact, and it looks quite a bit like that uh, that classic Briggs electric motor. And the other thing that I'm interested in this is because that does happen to be a local company. Uh, my friend Tom, who is into combat robotics, uh, has actually. Um, gotten a bunch of these uh sort of a special deal because they were a uh, a custom motor so it's very very similar to the mott energy 1117 uh but just a few minor changes but because that can't be sold retail he got sort of a batch of them and he's been using them for combat robotics uh the other thing is right down here he's using a motor controller that it's the robotech brand name which I had not heard of. Uh, he's absolutely loving it so far, and it's pretty darn cool. Um, you know, just printing out uh, the spec sheet on these motor controllers. Um, uh, there's two different versions, one for 60 volts, one for 96 volts, but uh, it gives you full regeneration control. There's a lot of analog and digital inputs and outputs uh, to rig up for a key switch, uh, safety features, dead man switch, emergency stop, all sorts of different things. And it's really, really flexible. It's got a lot of controls for uh, encoders, uh, hall motor sensors, uh, using the sine cosine analog inputs. Um, and it's all super tweakable uh, by uh, software that you can just download right, right off of their web page. Um, some of the other features, um, very programmable acceleration and deceleration. So that would make it really nice for on the tractor to not have it pop wheelies or be jerky or anything like that. Uh, quick, but very smooth speed adjustments to the motor. And so of course, the other reason why I am interested in, um, this combination of electric motor and controller is because my friend Tom has already been using this in his combat robotics. Um, I'll try to dig up a clip of his robot running because it is uh, scary powerful, no joke. Um, but the thing is to connect a motor like this to the tractor, uh, we need some sort of a, um, a plate to connect it in place. And actually right here you can see Tom just did a, a basic plate just to hold the motor in place for bench testing. But if we take a look here, uh, this is the International 300 Utility Tractor uh, with the original plate in place that the engine bolted to. Uh, down here this yoke is original. And on the side, these straight pieces are not. That's something I added. And that's actually to hold the front and the back of the tractor together because in a traditional tractor, uh, often the engine itself is actually part of the structure. So if you take away uh, the engine, you literally need a way to hold 
the front and the back of the tractor together. So those parts there are um, off of a farm all, which is basically a sister tractor to this tractor. Uh, so I can at least have everything held in place while working on this thing right here. But what I really need is some sort of a replacement uh, for this plate right here. And the other thing to keep in mind too is this plate was designed for um, that engine to bolt on. It does not have a bolt pattern for an electric motor. Um, and I got to figure out some templates. So the big thing that I did recently is I played around with designing a plate. So if you look here, it has that general outside shape of uh, our motor plate here. And then on the inside, it's got the ring and the four bolt holes for uh, that particular electric motor. It's also, it's a common bolt pattern. So I'd be able to swap out some other uh, motor in there in place as well. And by doing it in CAD, then what I can do is I can export a DXF file and send it to one of those online places, uh, Send, Cut, Send, or uh, some of the other ones where you just upload them a file, they laser cut or CNC or plasma cut the part and mail it to you. And this looks a lot easier than me trying to do it myself, especially since I don't have a plasma cutter. But what I do need is a really good accurate version of this in the first place. And I know I'm not going to have it perfect. So what I did was I thought, aha, I will make a cardboard version of this first. Now I do have a friend who over at his business, he has a laser cutter. So uh, Josh over at Brown Dog Gadgets was nice enough to uh, give me a hand and we just uh, put some cardboard in the laser and then laser cut it out. And that way, when I was all done, I had this uh, nice, perfectly cut piece of cardboard uh, exactly the size and shape that I was looking for. Now, unfortunately, oh, there's my cat who decided to jump into my cardboard adapter and then run around the house like that. Um, and so here's an example of uh, that original plate and one designed the whole the electric motor right next to each other. Um, that original plate is quarter inch steel. And here you can see the two together. And unfortunately, what I found when I put this in place, you can see here we've got some alignment pins on the top. Um, everything wasn't quite right. And frankly, the reason why is because I based um, this plate off of, um, well, taking a photograph of the original plate and then kind of tracing over it. But that wasn't quite accurate enough. And if we look here, for example, you can see that these holes are off. You can kind of see the threads and then where the hole in the cardboard is. It's off by enough that the bolts will not go through. And I could just like waller out those holes or something like that. But if I'm going to CAD design this, I just want it to be accurate in the first place. Now, the other issue is that uh, because that steel plate, it doesn't have a center. So I have to figure out, based on the holes that are already there, how to, uh, you know, exactly where to put the center. And that's another thing that I found out was my center wasn't right. It was off by a little bit. Now, it's exaggerated in this photograph uh, just because of the angle of the camera. But you can see here that the tip of the driven shaft and the transmission does not perfectly line up uh, vertically uh, with the center where the electric motor is going to go. So um, I did recently uh, work on um, trying to do a little bit better job. And what I did is I essentially just measured, um, I, I just did measurements of all the holes. Um, I measured from a couple of the sort of key locations. And then I also measured from all the various points. And some of it was a little bit tricky. Uh, for example, some points to the center. How do I find the center? Well, I still have the engine, but the, uh, the, the hub, the end of the crankshaft and the engine, it comes out. So I had to do some work to get some things level, try to get some good measurements. But now I've got some pretty darn good measurements here. And I did find out I was off by about half an inch on that centering ring. Um, and I did move these bolt holes here a bit. 
So now let's take a look in the CAD. I'm going to turn on a couple of parts. So this was my drawing. And then from that drawing, I was able to make a, a plate. I just extruded it to quarter inch to represent our uh, quarter inch. Let's see. And where did I put that in my file? Uh, the other thing I was able to do is uh, I found a CAD file of the motor that I want to do. It's a little bit slightly different version. Um, I did not 3D print that, but we can see this is a pretty accurate representation of one of those Mott Energy motors. I did have to modify it just a little tiny bit, but let's get our... And I think I accidentally moved my Well, you can kind of see with the drawing in place now um, how this works. We're measuring all the distances to the center. We found the center. And that's more or less what it's going to look like. And actually, I did... So the other part of it, too, is since I had that CAD model of the motor, I was then able to 3D print a version of the motor. So here I'm 3D printing it. It's a little bit less than eight inches. And because of that, I could just print it on my home 3D printer. And it's actually in two halves. So this is just the first half because there's um, the kind of the dimension on both ends is kind of made like a layer cake uh, in two halves, both with a flat side down for easy 3D printing. And then after the fact, uh, putting it together. So you can see here's that split line right here. And then when it was all done, I just took the two halves and I hot glued them together. I did have a little bit of warping in one spot, so I just covered that with uh, some white two-inch gaffer tape. So now we have a 3D printed motor mock-up. And what's pretty cool about that is, first of all, it's lightweight, so I can, you know, hold it in place with one hand and um, no magnets. I don't have to worry about um, dropping a washer in here and getting it stuck on the magnets or anything like that. So it's a really nice mock-up for the motor. And if you look at the end, it's dimensionally accurate for this centering ring and where uh, the mounting bolt holes are. And 3D printing is kind of cool because you can even do things. Uh, for example, uh, I've got some of the correct real hardware here, just a bolt. And what I did is I took a bolt, I heated it up with a uh, heat gun, and then just threaded the bolts right into the holes. And then they would actually take the threading. So I have essentially proper tapped holes already in my mock-up of the motor. So now I can start playing around with using the motor, testing it, literally bolting it in place. And it's not especially sturdy, but I've got my laser cut uh, cardboard plate here. Now this is still the original one, so the bolt holes aren't quite perfect, but it does work well enough that I can literally pop the motor in here. I see that that centering ring lines up. I could even put washers and uh, bolts right through there. So it's really cool to be able to um, try some of this out without spending a lot of money on parts or um, you know, even having to have the thing in front of me. So in this case, I didn't have to spend all the money on the motor. Um, I haven't spent any money or material uh, doing an adapter plate. So it's pretty cool to be able to kind of pre with some of these things. So let's pop back into the CAD software and let's see here. I, I misplaced the correct version of the plate I wanted to show you. Um, oh well, we'll just we'll use this one instead. So here, for example, oops, let's do the there we go. Uh, so right here, for example, uh, this is essentially what it would look like with that motor bolted onto the plate, and we have mock-ups for both of them. 
Uh, and because my friend has a number of these motors and those uh, Robotech controllers, I should be able to get a really good deal on those. And in fact, we can also take a look too at the, um, let me grab the rails. There we go. So essentially, this is about what the project should look like. Having that motor centered, having it bolted to that plate, uh, having those rails that go to the front of the tractor, everything all together. Now, there's still some challenges to this project. Uh, this motor is lower power than what the original gas engine is. But at the same time, I already have a separate motor just specific for running the hydraulics, a separate hydraulic pump motor uh, stripped out of a forklift. So the hydraulics in this project should actually be a lot better than in the original tractor setup, which just used a small hydraulic pump on the back end of the engine. And essentially that's kind of always uh, robbing some of the horsepower. So by splitting up the motors, I should be able to get away with using a little bit lower power motor. Uh, if we find out that this motor isn't good enough, we can always upgrade it to something else. Again, like I was saying, it's a pretty much standard uh, drive shaft and uh, face mount. But that does then also get us into uh, what do we connect on here? Because the other issue with the tractor is how the power is connected. So if we take a look again at our photos, here's a nice photo of a real motor matching up with our cardboard. And an example of a real motor next to our mock-up motor. So here's our mock-up um, at the transmission. And you can see in the transmission, there's the driven shaft, just like you'd have in a common little five-speed car. But then on top of it, um, there's also, let's uh, just make this a little bigger for you. So here's our driven shaft, and normally that would go to the clutch. And, but we also have this kind of collar around the shaft. So the shaft drives the wheels through the transmission but this collar is concentric. It goes towards the back of the tractor. It actually transfers energy through some gearing going down and then back out through a shaft uh, to the PTO. So this shaft here spins the entire time that the engine is spinning uh, because it's connected to the clutch cover. And the shaft for the wheels here, it can be separated uh, from the engine by the clutch. That means officially I need to have the flywheel in here. But that's also a little bit crazy because the flywheel on this tractor is huge. Um, altogether, uh, it weighs about 80 pounds. Uh, so here is just the flywheel. That by itself is 60 pounds. Uh, here you see the clutch in place. And then on top of that is that flywheel cover. That's another 20 pounds. So this is 80 pounds altogether, and I'd have to build a little adapter where that would be able to hold um, all the weight of the flywheel. So if we look back in the CAD here again, I've also got a little um, a little hub. So let's turn that on. So if you can imagine, now I have to design something to connect the shaft to a part that would essentially take up the end, what would be the end of the crankshaft, and then be able to have a flywheel go on there and not destroy the bearing in the motor. It just kind of causes a lot of issues. So what might be a better approach uh, would instead be to use these parts here. Uh, you can see there's these bolts that hold in the center of the clutch. So if those were ground off, we could get that splined bit from the middle. And the same on the clutch cover here, are these bolts, if those were ground off, this part here uh, could be pulled out. And then a solid coupler could be built. And that would go Oop, where'd my <laughs> 
And then that could go on the tip and this collar here, and then essentially be directly coupled to the drive shaft. Probably a two part thing, probably using um, uh, a Lovejoy connector. Uh, the downside of that is it would then make it so that uh, you couldn't, the one thing you wouldn't be able to do operating the tractor is have the PTO spinning with the tractor stopped and then gently pull away. You could just drive around in the tractor and turn the PTO on and off with the tractor already moving uh, because the engagement, the separate clutch for the PTO is actually a handle in the back of the tractor. So it would limit um, the usability of the tractor just a little bit. And what I'd really like to do is keep all of the usability of the tractor as much as possible. Uh, there's still some other ways this could be do, could be done. So for example, I was thinking a smaller motor is okay because we're dividing up the power. We've got a se separate pump motor is going to be uh, running the hydraulics. Uh, that would be like a 36 or 48 volt motor. And if I'm running the entire tractor at 72 volts, that's probably too high for it. But I could use a traditional uh, DC brushed motor motor controller to bring the speed down. That would also give me the ability to vary the speed of the hydraulics. So what we could do then is figure out what would be the uh, ideal speed for that motor for keeping current low, but also maximizing how quickly our hydraulics move. But the other approach is maybe the PTO could be completely separate, maybe have a separate motor running the PTO. But then in that case, where would we put that separate motor? Um, we'd also need to make sure that it still had some, some gearing going to it, probably just some planetary gearing or something like that. But again, it's kind of one more thing. Uh, so really, I just kind of wanted to show you some of this. Uh, in fact, here I also found a CAD file of uh, the motor controller that I wanted to use. So I did 3D print out a hunk of that as well. And then that'll just let me uh, play around with some ideas like uh, does this or does this not fit nicely under kind of the instrument panel of the tractor, for example. So by starting to use some of these physical components, it really lets me get into the project. Um, earlier, I should have mentioned project inertia. And, you know, that's kind of the issue sometimes is, um, you know, you get into... Um, if I'm going on a project, you know, the progress on the project itself is really what keeps keeps me going, keeps me excited about the project and keeps the ideas flowing. You know, keep going to the next thing, the next idea. Uh, what do we need to do to make this project happen? And with COVID and a lot of other things going on in life, uh, including just not having the resources that were normally available to me, including uh, people that normally I might just get together with in person bounce ideas off of none of that was available so that really put the entire project on hold for a while so even if this isn't the ideal motor even if it's not um you know the ideal parts the ideal voltage just by continuing on the project even if it's not quite the right thing uh it lets me keep going and once the project is in motion it tends to stay in motion but if it's stopped it tends to stay to stay stopped. And I'm, I'm not saying I'm uh, a master of, uh, you know, the, the three laws of motion here, but kind of the same thing sort of psychologically does actually apply to projects. So let's just go back uh, one last time to our photos here. Um, other thing I want to show you here is this is, this is what I ended up doing for uh, the measurements. And what I found it took a little bit of work to figure this out, but there were actually three points on that adapter plate that were exactly eight inches away from the center. And that were actually, um, it was actually two of these bolt holes, which were symmetrical. And if you cross those with a compass, it will cross at two points. So that actually gives us our vertical line. And then the other thing, these two bolt holes at the top, they were a little bit of an odd measurement, but I found that uh, the point halfway between them 
was also exactly eight inches away from center. So by having those uh, three points, I was then able to find the exact center of all these bolt holes. Because of course the bolt holes, they're not in a circle. You know, you can't just find center easily from them. And when I found center, the other thing that was uh, kind of a good hint and made me go, okay, cool, was just kind of that keyhole shape of what was already there. Um, uh, the four and a half inch circle for the mounting ring of the motor did look like it was perfectly uh, concentric with the top half of that mouse hole. So that was looking pretty good too. So now I should have all the exact measurements. Um, so here, for example, uh, this was eight inches from, well, you can't see them in the photo, but <laughs> up here and then on the adapter plate, but to match up the adapter plate and the crankshaft and everything, it was a little challenging. Um, taking measurements too with things being out of plane from each other. So for example, here I threaded a bolt in to the engine block just to space it up so it was uh, on the same plane as here. And then I was able to use a digital calipers to make those measurements. And this is what I ended up with. And then that's what I ended up putting into CAD. So now hopefully when I get a chance to laser cut uh, version two, of our cardboard mock-up. Uh, I'm hoping this time it should actually be pretty much absolutely perfect. So that's pretty much where we are on the project right now. Um, you know, again, nothing's perfect. Um, you know, we, we have to deal with um, what I have for skills, uh, what I have for budget, um, you know, what I have for time and energy. And actually, like in terms of skills, uh, within the last year, I've gotten a, uh, a 3D printer, which is pretty cool. I've been learning 3D printing. And even like the CAD stuff, just working on different little projects, I've been improving. I've been learning. So I actually do have more skills now than I did a year ago or three years ago, which really helps to be able to continue on a project like this. And actually, I did have one other little thing I just want to show you quick. Um, Right here, um, an issue that I had was I needed to be able to mark the exact centers of all these holes. And typically you would use um, something called a, a center punch for doing that. Uh, it's just a punch that's the exact diameter of the hole, but just has a little tiny point right in the middle. Uh, but these are big holes, they're five eighths. The biggest I even had was uh, half an inch. So I went, well, wait a minute, a punch isn't going to work because I'm just drawing this on tag board. What I really need is a pencil that can mark the center. So what I ended up doing was I literally just 3D printed my own tools. Uh, I took uh, the diameter of the hole. So the big ones here are five eighths. The smaller ones are half inch. And I just created a model that was half inch or five eighths on the outside. And on the inside, it had a hole, the diameter of the pencil in this case about eight millimeters. So the pencil is perfectly centered in this part. And I could just mark all these holes. You see there's a dot right in the middle and that's that exact location that I needed to do the measurements from. So it was kind of cool to just to, uh, you know, have the, the skills and the tools. So I'm like, oh, I gotta mark this exactly right. So the measurements are right. So literally made my own tool and that was pretty cool. Thought that was pretty neat there. So this is where we are on the project right now. Um, some of the next things are gonna be making that new cardboard adapter and just confirming that I've got my measurements exactly right, that I can make a metal version of that. So this is MK1, not perfect, but you know what? It's just cardboard. I can throw it away, recycle it, whatever. Cost me hardly anything in time and materials. And it was great for learning and helping figure all of this out. Um, then I can also uh, get my hands on a motor uh, get that metal plate uh, cut out, bolt those together, then I can start working on that adapter. Um, hopefully I can do this project without the flywheel, just because that's so much weight and spitting mass. And then after that, we can kind of think about the PTO uh, a little bit later as well. We can still work on figuring that out. Um, and of course, this really loves to change the color temperature of my camera. So I think we can re-white balance off of our white <laughs> electric motor mock-up but i think this thing's pretty cool the other thing that's actually sort of neat about this is there was a term i heard in education 
which is an artifact of learning. And that is uh, with school kids, help them learn by having them actually do something, have something to show for their work when they're all done kind of related to project-based learning. But the other thing that I think that's kind of cool about this is besides using it as a mock-up in the project, you know I'm going to have show and tell after this. Uh, we're going to be getting the tractor out to like car shows, Earth Day events, eco fairs, things like that. And when I'm telling people about how all this was designed and built and converted from an old gas tractor from 70 years ago to electric, you know, now I got a really cool prop to show them. Well, this is the size and uh, style of the motor here hold this you know so other people get to check it out and learn a little bit more about it and I think that's pretty cool too because uh, a big part of what I like about um, working on projects like this is really what I learn by working on it and then being able to share that and that's really why I do these uh, YouTube videos and everything like this as well so as always make sure you check out um, the comments uh, check out the video description and then also visit 300mpg.org for uh, blog, photos, and more on this project. And until next time, stay charged up. <laughs>